And I want us to begin by doing a word association game. But I'm changing it just a little. All right? You, you guys know what I mean by a word association game? Usually, I will say something, and you think of the first thing that comes to your mind, the first word that comes to your mind. But we're not going to do the first word that comes to your mind. I'm going to say a word, and I want you to think of what usually comes to your mind. Okay? Uh, because you know this word, you've heard this word before, and uh, we all have different things that we regularly associate with it when we hear this. You ready? Everybody awake? If your neighbor next to you is sleeping, give him a good pinch. <laughs> just, just kidding. Okay? Um, all right. Here comes the word. The word is, and what usually comes to mind, the word is salvation. Salvation. Give you a moment. All right, so have you thought of what usually comes to your mind? And uh, Rita, you were the first to nod, so what word that usually comes to your mind? <laughs> Salvation <laughs> Army. Okay. Let's, let's move away from this side of the uh, aisle and over to this side. Michael, what, what usually do you, comes to your mind? God. God. Okay. Charles, what comes to your mind? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, over here, uh, Phil, what comes to your mind? Rescue. Rescue. Andy? Hope. Hope. All right. Luis? The cross. The cross. Okay. You know, these are all good, and these are all proper. I thought about it, and I think they come in a lot of specific categories. One category I call the kind of rescue categories, okay? Rescue from hell, and that includes heaven. Another category is the very personal one, sin, forgiveness, peace with God, okay? You see how those are associated. Third category, eternal life. And, and I would say if we probably polled American Christians, that would be the one, eternal life would be the thing that most people come up with. Another one that is very popular is blessings and rewards. So those are the ones. But I want us today to think of one that I didn't hear, and quite frankly, I don't think we hear in this context often enough. So I want you to form a brand new association and it's not new, but I want you to make this perhaps far more prominent than all of the other ones that you were thinking. When I say salvation, I hope that you will start to think fellowship with God. Okay? Salvation, fellowship with God. And, um, you know, uh, let me give you an example. All right, you've heard the phrase, love the giver more than the gift, right? So important. Love the giver more than the gift. Well, with salvation, the giver and the gift at one level are the same thing. God comes and he gives himself. He wants to do more than cleanse us of our sins. He wants to do more than deliver us from hell. He wants to do more than all the things that we usually think about. He wants to give us the greatest happiness possible, and that is himself. Fellowship with himself. You remember... There is a saying, happiness is, and you fill in the blank, okay? Uh, I want to show you a happiness is picture. Can we put that up? Can you see that? 
happiness as grandpa, enjoying himself on the couch. Wow, we're zooming in. <laughs> and he's got his two granddaughters all over him. Okay, uh, and, and we're all doing semi-separate things. I'm wearing headphones because then I don't have to turn on the TV and share my programming with the entire neighborhood now that I'm hard of hearing. Okay, and the kids are getting their iPad time. But you know, they're not just doing their iPad time. One enjoys leaning on me, and I've got my arm around her, and the other one enjoys using me as her table. <laughs> okay, my lap is her table. Uh, and, and you know, there is no happiness greater. It's not the activity, it's the fact that I have them to myself I have them with me. And this is the idea that comes with thinking of it in terms of salvation. And when we receive God as our gift, and as we receive all the gifts, we really activate it through fellowship. We activate his love through fellowship. Super important for us to hear. We activate salvation through fellowship, and as our passage today will say, the result is complete joy. It will be an overflow of joy. And so that's why I'm saying, let's begin a most prominent association. Salvation, I say salvation, you say what? Fellowship with God, all right? And I'll tell you why this is so great. You know, it seems to me Christians today are just not as thrilled about their salvation as you would expect. You know, people just kind of take it for granted. Otherwise, we would do a lot more with it and about it. In fact, it's a little like that Christmas gift that we loved at the time we opened it, and now it's a month later, and it's sitting forgotten, perhaps in some part of the house where you're not even sure where it is, and it's been neglected and forgotten. So you bring home the puppy to the kids, right? Are they excited or what they are? But you know, by tomorrow, guess who's taking care of that little puppy? Yeah, dad, okay? Doing the cleanup, doing the feeding. Fido has become his gift, quote, unquote. All right? And so we, we, we seem to have this lackluster attitude about salvation, and that just shouldn't be possible. And I think it's because people often associate it primarily with things that are negative. Forgiveness of sins. Escape from hell. Avoiding judgment and God's wrath. These are kind of negative. They're blessings. But, you know, they're a little bit like when we went to school. And we had two kinds of teachers that were very memorable. There was the one who was the strict disciplinarian, right? And then there was the one who was your friend. And later on, when you finish and you return to the school, which one did you seek out? It was the one who was your friend. The one who could joke with you, the one who could talk with you, the one that everyone liked. And so that's the difference to take the negative association or the positive association. And so fellowship, I think, takes us in the right direction. As a parent, we want our kids to love us, not for what we provide, not for what we do, but just for ourselves, just for the relationship. Aren't we happiest just to have them want to be with us. My daughter-in-law 
said something to Pat and myself recently that was just the most wonderful thing. Now, most of you know, we've left the old house and we've moved into this tiny little townhouse. We've lost half of the space we used to have. So the four bedrooms are gone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so now we're in this cramped little townhouse and they moved in right after they got married. And they've been looking for a place to move to. But she said to us recently, you know, I could just live here indefinitely. <laughs> and you know, it wasn't as if she wanted to just kind of take advantage of things. But you know, the togetherness was good enough that she didn't feel compelled to move, to go on, to find her own place. She felt there was enough freedom, but enough closeness. They felt there was enough provision and cooperation. She felt all of that. And see, that's what we're looking for in life, to have that kind of relationship, that kind of fellowship. And that's the way God treats it. And that's why I want us to make this the primary association. You know, God not only loves us, God even likes us. I say that because there's a sister who often says that to me. She says, I love my family, but most of the time I don't like them. <laughs> and you, you get it, right? You have these ties that bind, but sometimes these ties are pretty confining, and you want to have that kind of like relationship. And especially today, because as we go on Facebook, it's easy to get depressed. Everybody else has more friends than me. Everybody else is doing more exciting things to me. And then if we could only focus on somebody super important who both loves you and likes you, you could throw away the Facebook. And that's what we have. God, the almighty God, loves us and he likes us. And he does it not just for mankind. He does it for us personally, individually. As he says in Isaiah 43, he knows us by name. You know, most of the time we meet somebody, they tell us their name. How long does it take for us to forget? Half a second? <laughs> Maybe less? And here's God who knew us by name even before we came. I think of the moms and the dads who are planning for their child and they're picking that name and they experience such great joy at finding just that perfect name. Ephesians 1.3 says this, and I'm going to take this into verse 4. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Then verse 4, even, even as he chose us in him, before when? The foundation of the world. Before he started creating, he knew us by name. He chose us, and then just like a new parent would do, they will choose the room, they will decorate the room, they will furnish the room, they will put up the wall coverings, they will do all these things to express that. And that's what it talks about in the previous verse where they will bless us with every spiritual blessing because he's already chosen us. And that's how he loves us. And then in verse 5, if we jump ahead, it says, and you know what? He predestined us for what? Adoption as sons. Okay? Now, this is part of that love. 
And what it says is he wants a permanent relationship with us. You guys heard of the Lone Ranger? Used to be a TV show, right? And so a town would be having some problems and the Lone Ranger would show up and he would solve the problem. He would save the town. And then he would do what? Every episode. He would get on his horse and he'd yell, Hi-o Silver. Silver was the name of his horse, all right? So he was getting his horse to, let's get going. And he was telling his horse, let's get running out of here. You know? God is no Lone Ranger. He didn't just come and save us and he wants to get out of here. He wants a permanent relationship. And in the Lone Ranger, as he's riding away, they would always show two of the townspeople. And they would look at each other. And one of the townspeople would say, who was that masked man? Right? They never got to know him. He came and he saved them and then he gets out of town. He's gone. He's no longer a part of their lives. God is not like that. He adopts us as sons. He wants something permanent and close and complete. So different. I think of another piece of cinema, the movie Casablanca. How does that one end? Humphrey Bogart and Claude Rains are walking away from the airplane and they're heading back into town. And Humphrey Bogart turns to Claude Rains, his former, I'm not sure if you're my friend or my enemy, says, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful relationship. That's what salvation and its association with fellowship is all about. Just the beginning of a beautiful relationship. That's what God is looking for, and he hopes that we're looking for the same thing. 1 Corinthians 1.9 puts it very, very clearly, and I'm going to wait for it to go up, and it says this, God is faithful by whom you were called into what? Into fellowship. The fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, was with the Father. And so he's bringing us in the mysterious relationship of God, the Trinity, loving one another. Well, that basically is what the second half of the prologue of 1 John is telling us. Last week, we covered the first two verses of this four-verse prologue. Let's put up 1 John 1, 1 to 4, and let's read it together, all right? And uh, the first half, the first two verses, John is saying, don't listen to the heresies that are coming into church that says that Jesus was not God, he did not come in the flesh, because flesh is evil, and God is spirit, and he is therefore good. He's saying, listen to me, all right? No, no, starting at verse 1. Listen to me, John says. He says, we know what we're talking about. We live with this guy. We spend time with this guy. We were there from before the, we were there from the beginning to the end, and we speak with authority. That's what the first two verses says, all right? And then he comes to, and the result is that you might have fellowship and that through the fellowship, you will have complete joy. But you've got to know the truth first. All right, so let's look at verse 1, okay? And verse 2. That which was from the beginning, 
which we have heard. See, he's talking about Jesus, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon. And then he gets to the part about post-resurrection. We have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Okay, next verse. And he's using the same kind of language that he used in the gospel chapter one of John. All right. So he says, and the life was made manifest to us. In other words, what we could not have expected or understood became clear when it appeared in front of us. And we have seen it and we now testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life that comes with it, which was with the Father and has been made manifest to us. Now he gets to the fellowship and the joy. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard He's repeating back, making sure we tie it in with the true gospel that he just talked about in verses 1 and 2. Now we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, actually, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We enter into the heavenly divine fellowship. One more verse. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. And so he is saying that that is the purpose. And when I was reading this and studying this, and I realized that we need to make this primary association where when I say salvation, what do you say? Fellowship. Fellowship Fellowship with God, okay? I was saying, am I going off out on a limb by making this strong an association? Then I ran across this quote Let me read it to you. It goes like this. The more I think of and pray about the state of religion in this country and all over the world, the deeper my conviction becomes that the low state of the spiritual life of Christians is due to the fact that they do not realize that the aim and object of conversion is to bring the soul even here on earth to a daily fellowship with the Father in heaven. And for those of you who know, this is a quote from Andrew Murray. And Andrew Murray, he's a saint, and you write it with a capital S. Okay? The rest of us, we are saints, but it's with a small s. This guy, it never was proclaimed the same, but that was the magnitude of, of his godliness. And so, salvation, you see, the removal of sin was the removal of the impediment to what? Fellowship. Eternal life so that we can fellowship for how long? Eternity. You see, it makes sense. All of these are bridges to enable and make that fellowship full. And it's so nice to have somebody so magnificent who not only loves us, but likes us. And that's what he's doing. And this is what Christianity is about. And I can tell you that there is a real satisfaction. And then we come to verse 4. Let's put verse 4 back up there. And so he's saying, and I'm telling you these things, I'm writing them to correct your understanding of Christianity and the purpose of it being fellowship so that our joy may be complete. You know, what is complete joy? Here is complete joy. Complete joy is when the joy is so great in its power and its vast hold in your life that it eclipses every other negative experience. You could be going through troubles. You can be in the middle of fear. You could be in the middle of uncertainty and the unknown. You could have been rejected and hurt by somebody very deeply. But through this fellowship, you can have the kind of joy that takes over and pushes out all those things and gives you the power to move forward. 
and deal with it in life. And that's the blessedness of this fellowship. Well, Lord's Supper, so we're going to conclude. How do we practice this fellowship with God today? Well, it begins with starting into that fellowship, and our entry is to remove the impediment. And so we say to God, forgive me my sins. I want you as my Lord and Savior, right? That's called accepting Jesus Christ and becoming a Christian. So that's the first step that every one of us needs to go to. Second, Amos 3.3, 3, quoting and reciting from the old King James, it goes, can two walk together except they be agreed? So fellowship from the very beginning in Genesis was talked about as walking with God. Right? Walking with God, going through life together with God. That's what marriage is. You're walking through life together closely from now on. And so you have to be in agreement, Amos 3.3 3 says. And here's the way Jesus said it. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him, John 14, 23. So it means we've got to know his word. We need to embrace his word. We need to let it be a guiding part of our lives. See, most people, just like we said with names, we hear it once and we forget it. See, we've got to start internalizing God's word because it reveals his values, it reveals his character, it reveals to us the lifestyle and the attitudes that we should have. And as we do this, we show love. You know, um, parents often, as they come to the end of their time, this is what they say to the children, second parent to die. After I'm gone, stay close, be a family, right? That's an expression of the heart's desire of the parent. And the kids, if they live in obedience to it, they are abiding. They're continuing in fellowship. And they remember what it was like, and they remember what these words mean, and they remember the heart of the parent. And we do the same thing with God. As we live according to his word, then we're abiding in his word, and we are in fellowship with him. We're living our lives in relationship to the guidance of his life and words. Third, and connected that is to do your devotions. And then in verse 3, the other thing is said is seek fellowship with other believers. Okay? Uh, when God appears to you, and you talk about it, he has appeared to me. You follow that? When Mary experienced Jesus after the resurrection, and Jesus says, now, let me go. You go back and you tell my brothers and sisters, your fellow Christians, share your experience of me with them. Because I'm not going to be a parent to everybody I'm not always going to be doing things. I'm not always going to be touching your life. But when I do, tell others about it so that they know that I'm still here, I'm still active, and we fellowship, that there is interaction where necessary. You get that? And so this is how we have this fellowship with one another, and God is actually at the center. So when I say salvation, you say fellowship with God. All right. And out of that, if you learn to develop in it, you will have that complete joy that will empower you to anything that life can throw at you. He loves you. He knows you by name. And he even likes you. 
okay? Which is more than we can say about each other. <laughs> so, anyway, um, let's uh, move on now to our communion service.